We will all rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Simon Chin, a fifth grader at Riderwood Elementary School. We will remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who've served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Our, our first item for the evening is our agenda. Uh, are there any changes or additions to our, tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? Uh, there are none. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. There is a second. It's second. been moved and second. All those in, in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Our agenda is adopted for this evening. Our next item is a selection of speakers. <coughs> Sign-up cards were available to the public to, uh, prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening has been placed in the box to my right. And the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. First speaker is Dr. Bosch Farron. Second speaker is Muhammad Jamil. Third speaker is Simon Chin. Fourth speaker is Shu Sha. Five. Number five is Crystal Collins. Uh, six. Number six is Farouk Marfani. Seven. Number seven is Jing Chow. That's it. All right. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities we provide to hear the views and receive advice from our community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe our timer, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. At this time, we'll call up uh, members of our advisory group. <coughs> our first speaker for tonight is the president of TABCO, Ms. Abby Baton. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. The reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act by Congress is already having an impact on schools throughout the nation. The old No Child Left Behind iteration of the law is now aptly renamed the Every Student Succeeds Act. This new rewrite brings with it the promise of more autonomy for schools with less testing and punishing. It also creates opportunities to address the whole child. This is good news, but a lot is left up to the state and locals to determine. 
To that end, TABCO has embarked on important work to not only inform educators, but also the community of the changes in the law as well as the possibilities for positive changes for our students. We have tasked a small group of folks, including teachers, a parent, and a TAPCO staff member to begin training on the parameters of changes, as well as how we can affect change here in Baltimore County. The group came back from the training energized and ready to move forward with this information. We are looking ahead to work with various groups holding forums and forming coalitions with stakeholders throughout Baltimore County. We are anticipating working with BCPS to make sure we help education move forward in a way that is appropriate for all students and at the same time inclusive of all groups. Please be looking for more information from TABCO over the coming year as we formulate our next steps. We hope you will be able to take part in this important work as we strive for the best for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Our next speaker is from our Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Ms. Pamela Guest. Good evening. Good evening. As we approach Dyslexia Awareness Month in October, I wanted to commend BCPS for the swift attention to matters related to dyslexia and literacy in the past nine months. I also wanted to remind you how delayed identification and the absence of evidence-based interventions can impact the lives of students who struggle with reading. These students who by all other means may appear to be of typical aptitude are easy to overlook and are often assumed to be not trying hard enough by teachers and administrators who are not properly trained to identify characteristics of the neurodiversity that causes them to struggle to process the materials as others do. That's why early screening and formal assessments are so important. Research shows that 95% of students who are identified with a need and get interventions beginning in kindergarten and first grade can, brought, can be brought up to grade during elementary school and may complete their educations with the same opportunities as their neurotypical peers. As we begin to implement new efforts, we mustn't forget those students at the middle and secondary levels who have passed the threshold for these efforts and remain strugglers in the system. You may remember my son, Dane, whose dyslexia was overlooked until a few months before graduation. He has learned to compensate for many of his challenges, but there is no compensation for the missed opportunities caused by his education gaps and reading struggles. Although he receives additional services, the efforts are at best a hit or miss, and I see him slowly losing interest in an intervention method that was designed to address the needs and interest levels of youngsters. His challenges limit, limit his job prospects and have impacted his confidence. He is working for a home improvement firm and comes home each day worn and nicked from the physical dema physically demanding work, respectful work, but not what he had envisioned for his career path. While he is determined to be successful, he is also frustrated that the opportunities to pursue his professional interests may be jeopardized by his challenges. I remain determined that he will not end up on the unfortunate side of a, st of, of a statistic that indicates that young men like him will join 70% of the prison population that is functionally illiterate. Mm -hmm. In my new role as vice chair of CCAC and the communications director for DDMD, I hear a range of stories about confusion, misguidance, and inconsistency across the system. We are anxiously awaiting the release of the technical assistant bulletin from the dyslexia task force. I hope that BCPS will create and implement a plan of commitment and follow-up to ensure that personnel have read it, understand it, and implement the changes necessary to comply with the recommendations. As you do so, please remember and consider any measure, measures that can help improve the outcomes for students who have advanced beyond the elementary school interventions but who continue to struggle. I beg you to address efforts aimed at remediation with a sense of urgency. We need teachers trained to be effective educators of the students, resources in place to help them learn, universal accommodations and modifications for students who need them, and information campaigns that result in informed teachers, staff, and parents. A bright young people who happen to learn differently may be at stake. Thank you, Ms. Guest. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, Leslie Weber.
Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. I'm Leslie Weber, PTA Council Communications Chair, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Emory Young. In May 2016, BCPS changed the rule on sharing student directory information in the related opt-out form. For this academic year, parents must agree to have their child's photo and even name shared on social media if their child wants to be included, for example, in the yearbook. This is unacceptable, and PTA Council has heard from parents all over the county that this is a major concern. We appreciate being able to attend a focus group to revise the opt-out form and hope that BCPS fully addresses concerns. We believe a form with simplified learn wording will allow parents to make the privacy-related choices they intended to. If the new form is modeled after other school systems forms, including Montgomery County's, children's privacy rights will be better protected. We're also pleased that the form is moving away from its current all-or-nothing approach to privacy to a more flexible menu of options on opting out and data sharing. Common Sense Media, the leading independent nonprofit dedicated to children's safe use of media and technology, is a BCPS partner. And one of its top privacy experts, Bill Fitzgerald, has written about opt out forms, including BCPS's, and protecting student privacy. Knowing that the Board of Ed's Policy Review Committee will revisit this matter in October, PTA Council would like to share some of Mr. Fitzgerald's guidance. Create a social media policy for teachers and staff that limits the amount of information they can share about students via media. Publishing students' pictures online has the potential of crossing serious legal and ethical lines. When posting students' pictures on social media, stop to think about whose story is being told and to what audience. Is it the student's story or the adult's? Is tweeting or posting furthering children's education or is it being used as advertising? Fitzgerald stated that kids don't walk through the school doors so adults can use their likeness and work on social media. Overall, he recommended, and PTA Council agrees, that there's an obligation to err on the, on the side of restraint. At the focus group, the idea of having social media training and guidelines for teachers and staff was raised. PTA, PTA Council believes this is a step in the right direction to better protect student privacy rights. Another issue of concern is the recently revamped grading policy. PTA Council is aware that many students are anxious and parents and teachers confused about this sudden and major change and that the policy appears to be implement, implemented unevenly across, both across and within schools. We're pleased that the BCPS website provides the ability to submit feedback on the policy and we hope that input is carefully considered. With the middle of the first marking period soon approaching, we hope that BCPS continues to clarify this new process for students, parents, and teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Our next speaker is from our education advisory group uh, from the Northeast Ed Advisory Council, Ms. Julie Hen. Thank you, Chairman McDaniels. Good evening, members of the board, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. A few weeks ago, the Northeast Area Advisory had the pleasure of hosting Ms. Ann Miller and Ms. Kathleen Causey for our first meeting of the year. Ms. Miller presented on public engagement, strategies, and tools. She answered the question, how can citizens provide input and help drive improvement within BCPS? Family engagement is absolutely essential for learner success, and it starts with education. Many families have concerns. They don't know where to turn for help. Many have amazing ideas, but they don't know how to contribute. On behalf of the advisory and the Northeast community, I wish to thank Ms. Miller and Ms. Causey for their valuable time to this important endeavor. The information they shared is key to increasing engagement. I would also like to thank Mr. Steve Virch for his continued responsiveness and efforts on behalf of the Northeast community. I would like to encourage the board to continue such efforts to connect with the community through communication, education, and outreach. No one can express the concerns and ideas of the Northeast better than the community members themselves. We hope to connect with many of you at an upcoming Northeast advisory meeting this year. You are all welcomed and encouraged to join us. Let's work together to get the ball rolling for even better Northeast schools. And let's start with securing adequate classroom space for Perry Hall. Thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, in our public comment section, Dr. Bosch Farone.
Good evening to all. Good evening. On 8.23, Mr. Nussbaum quoted the establishment clause as he encouraged board members not to vote for Eid equal Yom Kippur. The establishment clause of the United States Constitution applies to all religions, not really to one. And by the school system closing on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, it's advocating one religion over others, it's advertising for one religion over others, it's favoring one religion over others. Everyone in the school system for 21 years knows it was not based on a secular reason 21 years ago. Many still pretend that it is for a secular reason. It is done for a political reason, and that's all. In my last presentation, I ask you to nullify the vote in relation to the Eid. On one reason, Ms. Bratt has voted, and she's not really allowed to vote on closing schools. And on the other is the unfortunate comments of Ms. Eaton, which really shows bias. And I really have not really heard any response. I'm really truly amazed that not even an 80 kilobyte email letting me know yes or no or you are not really making sense. The policy is clear. Last but not really least, and I really caution you to my fellow board members. Calendar committee is going to give you an option where in one year they will close on Rosh Hashanah, in another year they will keep it open. And the goal for that is really to study absenteeism, and all of a sudden we have secular reason to close on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. This is absolutely wrong. The school system should not and must not spy on the religious beliefs of Baltimore County residents. Keeping any statistics in relation to religion is anti-law, anti-constitution, and Anyone who doesn't really show on any holiday, it means the person needs to take off. That's what happened 21 years ago. A few students and few teachers lobbied their friends, and they got larger number, and they said, you know, here, here is a large number. But that doesn't prove the religious beliefs of the person. The school system needs to respect its words. When we talk equity, we need to talk equity and practice it. Otherwise, we are really giving a lip service for the communities. And that is really not in the best interest of the school system. Last but not really least, this microphone is being closed all the time. Some people really go over, Mr. Chairman, and some people don't. And I have been very compliant for a long time. I do apologize for taking longer period of time. But honestly, respecting you, I don't think it's really suitable for what I believe you believe in. I mean, if somebody takes 15 seconds more, what's the big deal about it? You know, it's about freedom of speech. It's about putting the ideas and really engage and communicate to <coughs> you. So I really hope that you would consider not really doing that. And I really truly appreciate if you don't. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Mohammed Jamil. Peace and good evening. Good evening. Chairman McDaniel, Dr. Dance, you see me adjust my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and the esteemed members of the board. I would like to thank the board to have taken up the issue of closing of the schools on the two Muslim holidays. Each board member, his sense of, or her sense of justice was tested and displayed on August 23rd. Rose by any color or any name is a rose. Christmas, Easter, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha are exactly what they are however defined in the Dictionary of Secularity. The issue of closing to the schools on those holidays is that of equality. 
double standards exist amongst unenlightened people. We do not think nor believe in the lack of understanding of educators and those who are guardians of this system. Justice is dispensed based upon laws and precedents. The precedence of closing schools on the other minority holidays exists. It was clearly stated during the debate amongst the board members that there was no criteria used by Dr. Berger and his board to establish the other two holidays, period. So what are the reasons of dissension by five members? The dissension is based upon myriad of non-existing criteria. Religiosity, secularity, number of students, absenteeism, precedence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Dear board members, precedence has already been set since nearly two decades. Enumerating such reasons also reflected an implied fear of taking a firm action and kicking the can down the road. Leaders of the people are for the people and not for the state. Justice is not dependent upon how many people are wronged but it is to prevent any wrong to even one person. Leaders look for reasons to resolve matters in favor of people, not dig up reasons to reject the need of its people. It is worse when it is done in the name of justice or to protect an ideology such as secularity. I had protested and voiced the right to vote by our esteemed student board member. All of you remember the response. Well, page nine of the handbook of, Baltimore, of the Baltimore County Public School Board of Education declares that student board member not vote on school closings, reopenings, boundaries. Therefore, the board needs to nullify the result of that voting. Justice must be restored, and the schools should be closed on those Muslim holidays. Leaders need to stand up and be counted with pride to do people's work and shed any hesitancy and any ambivalence. Laws. Laws are made by men and are amended by men to improve the quality of the society. God bless you, and I hope that you will keep this in mind that we are all for each other, not for just individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Simon Chin. Good evening, BOE officials and Dr. Dance. My name is Simon Chen, and I am in fifth grade of, of Riderwood Elementary School. Our school is the first national blue ribbon school in Baltimore County, and she just turned 50 years old this year. Riderwood Elementary School is in Lutherville, and there are a lot of Asian American kids in our community. We have a loving principal and teachers, and we are very happy in our school, but I still have a wish. I wish one day we can have our holiday as well, Lunar New, New Year, so that we are equal to other kids. Thank you so much for your considerations. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. I'm the next. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Would you pronounce your name for me, please? Shu Li Xia. Shu Li Xia. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Thank um, you. Dear honorable uh, BOE members and Dr. Dance, uh, my name is Shu Li Xia, and I'm working at Johns Hopkins as a faculty. I'm a member of Chinese American Parent Association of Baltimore County, in short, Kappa Baltimore. This is a sister organization of Kappa in other counties, including Harvard and Montgomery County. The mission of this organization is to support Asian, Chinese, Asian American parents and children to get informed, involved, and engaged, engaged in public school and community matters by building bridges between BOE, BCPS, PTA, parents, and our community at large. Like other counties in, Amer in Maryland, Baltimore County is experiencing gro uh, growth in its diversity. In the past decades, the Asian community has become more visible. The county saw a significant increase in Asian, American, uh, Asian population. Those originated from China, Korea, Vietnam, Indonesia, Singapore, and many other Asian countries share similar culture, heritage, 
those families form a vital group of taxpayers contributing to the county's economy through property tax, income and sales tax, as well as through their work benefiting the county and the state. The school calendar, we think, uh, and the school academic ac uh, calendar needs to reflect the increased diversity. Therefore, we are launching a project to requ request the Baltimore BOE to recognize Lunar New Year in 2018 by closing school or combining one of the professional developed days with the Lunar New Year. Lunar New Year celebration follows a tradition for over three thousands of years. Every year, like many other major metropolitan in the U.S., the Chinese communities in the Baltimore D.C. metro area has multiple large celebrations activities, such as spring festival galas and Chinese school performance in D.C. and Maryland. The Lunar New Year to Asian is as important as Christmas and widely celebrated by people with East and Southeast Asian origins, no matter where they are. We are glad to see that a lot of educators recognize the fairness and equal treatment in public school system. In fact, our neighbor Harvard County Public School already placed a professional learning day on the Lunar New Year in 2016 and 2017, which would give students the day off from school on the biggest holiday in Asia. So we hope Baltimore BOE can also approve our request, as we know that our county educators are also very inclusive to embrace cultural diversities by recognizing holidays from other religions and areas. We also trust that our county BOE is willing to listen to the public and address parents and student concerns. In fact, I'm very impressed with uh, how fast the BOE and the Baltimore County work together to address the AC issues in this years. Thank you very much and enjoy the evening. Thank you. It, uh, it moves? It moves, yeah, different, different. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, normally in January and February. Okay, yeah, thank you. I can't leave the picture. Thank you. Our next speaker is Crystal Collins. Good evening. I am here to talk about the new grading policy. It seems that the only people who are able to translate this policy for Baltimore County are Baltimore County officials and administration. Who exactly is being helped by this policy? Not the students. In the old way of grading, when a student earned a 50, that equaled 50%. With the new way, students can earn a zero, which now is an LS, which stands for lowest score, and then they receive a grade of 50%. When parents of hardworking students complained about the LS coding, they were told that 50% for both scales is still a failing grade. That is true, but grades are supposed to reflect, be a reflection of how much content a student actually knows. As a parent, if my child received a grade of 50%, I would assume that she knows 50% of the class content. With the new grading policy, she could technically, technically know nothing and still get a 50%. I have heard officials say that the, there's the old way that there were 59 ways for a student to fail. Well, that's ridiculous. There's only one way to fail. If you don't know the content, Content, you fail. If you learn the content, you pass. Why is there even an option of a code for, uh, of lowest score, which is represented by a grade of 50%, when you now have a redo policy? If a student earns a 10%, then give them the 10%. Why should they get a default grade of 50% since now they have the option of actually studying and redoing the assignment to get a better grade? Who exactly is this policy supposed to help? Not the students. It seems to me that this 50-point scale is just a thinly disguised way of overinflating grades, which in turn will produce an overinflated graduation rate. This new policy is not meant to help students excel. It's just a way to graduate more students who actually know less information in an information age. As a parent, I have a problem with this because my child and her classmates will be competing globally against students from China, India, and Japan who come here on student visas and enter our prestigious colleges. You can bet your bottom dollar that these foreign students did not get a 50% for doing nothing. However, our students will be squeezed 
out of entering medical schools, engineering programs, and other STEM careers because they won't be able to compete academically because they were not taught how to work hard for their grades. This kind of grading policy will help to create a, a culture of future American workers who will end up being second-class citizens in their own country. Who exactly will benefit from a policy that produces an overinflation, uh, overinflated graduation rate? Not the students, because by the time they realize that they have been cheated out of an education, it will be too late. They will have already graduated, and they will no longer be BCPS's problem. Our motto is supposed to be creating a culture of deliberate excellence. This is not deliberate excellence. This grading policy is deliberately deceptive and is deliberately dishonest. The students of Baltimore County Public Schools and their parents deserve better. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Farouk Mafrani. It means, Muslim peace, that peace and blessing on everybody. Good evening, dear respected board members, chairman, uh, ch chief, chief of school, I met him a couple of times. Let me start here because I, I sometimes I don't put the note here, I just, uh, just talk. But some say, now put it in a note, otherwise your three minutes will be gone. <laughs> first, of, first of all, congratulations to all the members that is, since 1989, we celebrated Eid al Adha on September 12 with everybody. All the kids were there, parents were there, we went for places. It was uh, since 1989, I'm here since 1984, never happened. So congratulations to the board to change the professional day to the Eid day. See, everybody included. In my house, my, my kids, Jewish student came, Christian student came in the neighborhood, and we celebrate everybody. The kids, they don't know who is Jewish. They are all students. Other thing is that, that I have three girls. They went to the school from Woodlawn. Now I have no girls in the in your education. But they all well qualified. Last girl went to Western High because they're scared to go to Woodlawn. Hmm. Even Woodlawn is better school now. My three girls are valedictorian. First girl become valedictorian, Muslim girl from Woodlawn. Second Woodlawn. The principal said, Mr. Marfan, you need more girl? I said, yes, it's coming up. <laughs> but she refused, she refused to go to the Woodlawn. She went to Western Tech. The principal, principal was there two weeks ago. The principal was there, there. So now let me, let me read one thing which is bothering me, still bothering me, which is about a student. The board strongly believe in the active participation of the student, which is demonstrated through the appointment of a student member to the Board of Education. The student who shall serve for one year shall be an 11th or 12th grader who shall advise the board thoughts, board on the thoughts and the feeling of the student. Student board members have voting rights. However, they may not vote on the following matters. Discipline and discharge of certified employees, collective bargaining matters, capital and operating budget, and school closing, reopening, and the boundaries. So this is here. Here's the paper. And if you, if you want to keep reminding yourself, I'm going to scan it tonight, and I'm going to send everybody for the record. So this is here, you know, and I will just keep reading, keep reading. I love this student. This is look like my daughter. My daughter age might be younger than that. But I love her, you know, and it should be a very good policy. Next item, time is over, so I have nothing to say, and I respect your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, sir, if you want to email us or give us a copy of your comments, we'll include it in the record. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our next speaker is, I guess it's Bing Chow. Uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Please tell me how your name is pronounced. Yeah, uh, uh, Bing Chao. Okay, thank yeah. you. 
Um, good evening, um, dear all. Uh, first, I would like thanks uh, for the um, Baltimore County uh, Board of Education. Uh, my son has been through the uh, he, most of his primary, you know, education here. Um, he just got admitted into MIT and begin Ooh. a new journey there. And Great. part of you know, I think most of his um, success really, um, really b because of the BOE has a very good, you know, GT uh, policy, education, you know, policy. So I first I would like to thank that. And uh, um, I'm also a part of a Chinese American Parents Association. Um, we, same as Mr. Xia, uh, we come here also, uh, we come here to really, um, Suggest to suggest to the board of education uh, to have the opportunity to recognize Lunar New Year uh, on the um, 2017 2018 um, school calendar year, uh, which exactly the, the exact date is February 16th. Could be you know. Um, together with uh, f um, very close to uh, professional uh, days in in the 2018. Um, during the past like um, 14 years, uh, you know, be a mom um, who come to United States after age 30, I have struggled a lot. You know, how, first how to let my son fit in the you know the new communities. Another thing is how to preserve our uh, diversity by keep all the good traditions we could bring into this new 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 country. Um, part of my effort is to be a, 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 a teacher in Chinese uh, school. And um, the subject I teach was uh, culture uh, and history. So that's why I, I think I really, during my communication with my students, you know, those years, I realized how important the cultural identity um, to, to be the part of a healthy, uh, um, you know, psychological, to, to contribute to the students' um, uh, psychological health. So I would like to share a piece written by a father of an 18-year-old Asian-American boy died from a fatal car incident, accident in uh, June 2015. The father said, in his life, he struggled with his identity. Like many children of first generation of immigration, he fought silently for his unique identity and refused to accept any stereotype um, preconceptions. He just wanted to be accepted as 100% American case. Yes. So the identity struggle, um, you know, described by the father is really very typical among all the Asian American uh, teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, it's very challenging for the parents, um, for us to preserve our cultural tradition where our kids struggled to fit in at school with very few Asian adults as role model. Um, Lunar New Year is uh, the most important holiday for each Asian. I, I calculate there are 11 countries uh, in Asia celebrate this holiday. So uh, that's why we really hope that this holiday could be recognized um, similar as Christmas, Good Friday, Easter, or other, um, or other holidays from other uh, respective religions. Um, school is a place to foster identity. Thank you. Who's that? He's a big part of this area. All right. Uh, our, uh, our next agenda item is new business, uh, personnel matters, and we'll call forward Dr. Mayo. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice 
Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Good evening. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements and resignations. Do I have a motion to approve exhibits F1 and F2? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Mr. Collins. Um, point of order. Yes, sir. When a person in the audience uh, shouts to someone uh, who's speaking, mm -hmm. uh, I believe that uh, that person in the audience should be excused from the meeting. And I, I think it's a, a, a grievous uh, oversight that the chair has said nothing about it. And, and I think uh, it should not go undealt with at this point. I think we should uh, stop the meeting. We should, if, if you're not prepared to, to deal with it, we should deal with it as a board. Mr. Chairman, I just apologize to our speaker because that was what we heard out yeah, of. It was very rude. I, I wasn't sure who did it. That's why well, I was. Ralph is sitting right there. He can certainly find out. That's not acceptable to not be sure. You ought to be sure. You have to be sure. You're the leader of this board. Do something and do the appropriate and correct thing and do it now. Well, I don't know that we know who shouted out. Well, I think we do. And if you did, you try to find out. Did you ask Ralph? I don't see Ralph. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I don't think we want to delay the meeting. It won't be accepted in the future. It's I, not really proper, and I, it I don't. It is really proper to deal with it and not to be pussyfooting around like you always do about everything. Okay. Well, if the board wants to take action, I won't uh, impede that. But I don't um, want to con continue this discussion. Well, I mean, first. sometimes things are so outrageous that we ought to do something about them when they happen. Well, if you, would you like to make a motion of some sort? I was hoping that you would deal with it. Uh, I think that that person who, who is, is identified as calling out to that person who was speaking, that person should be escorted from the meeting and told that they cannot come back for the rest of this meeting. They're not in the meeting. That's, that's the motion I would make, and I would hope that we would do that. Second. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. So I guess we need to determine then who uh, called out. Yeah. I know who it was. All right. Mr. All right. Chair. Yes. I, I think it might be proper to invite our guest from the public back to finish those comments since she yeah. was not asked by the board to stop speaking. I think that would be appropriate. Uh, I don't know if I need to make a motion to that no, effect. I think we, we would do that. Um, Thank you. The last speaker that was interrupted, if they would like to come forth and finish your remarks, because that was a very rude interruption. Thank you so much for all the considerations. Yeah. I think my, my, my last statement here is I hope um, BOE can approve our request. And also, I believe, you know, work together. Um, by work together, we can build a great community together and mutual the next generation of American, American citizens to have understanding of, of, of all the international culture. And I think Asian community has a great deal of um, contribution could be made even more into this society. Hopefully, uh, next year, on um, February 16, 2018, um, if, you know, if our request has been approved, we, we already plan to do a lot of community uh, outreach program to really, uh, um, to really pass over our um, appreciation and also um, hope to help the community realize you know, um, what kind of um, really traditional, tra traditional culture from, from Asian for Lunar and, uh, Calendar Year. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And we, <laughs> we do very much appreciate all the comments that we receive, and we will have to adhere to our three-minute rule guidelines just to be fair to all our people. And I think when we begin to extend uh, and vary our rules, we, we all get ourselves in trouble. So, uh, but again, we appreciate all the comments and appreciate your, uh, appreciate your cooperation. All right, so uh, our next uh, agenda item is consideration of action taken in closed session, and for that, I'll ask Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. 
Thank you. Good evening. I ha don't worry about it. Earlier this evening, the Board of Education considered seven appeals regarding confidential employee and student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. One was an oral argument where the Board heard from the parties in the case. Six were considered on the record or in summary affirmances as no requests were made for oral argument. Uh, it, was, uh, it would be appropriate at this time to confirm the action taken in closed session in those matters which were. The oral argument was uh, uh, hearing examiner number 1653. The summary affirmances were 17-02, 1707, 1709, 1710, 1711, and 1713. Thank you. I do have a motion to approve action taken in closed session. I move that we approve the action taken in closed session. Second. Hey, second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? <laughs> Not. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. The orders will be on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next item is new business, contract awards. Uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Gillis for this section of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the business and contracts, <laughs> the building and contracts committee met earlier and considered four matters. They are H1, H2, H3, and H4. Uh, the four-person committee unanimously recommends to the board items H2, 3, and 4, and the committee voted three in favor and one against uh, uh, contract H1. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to uh, approve items K1 through H. K H1 through H4? Is it is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mr. So. Chair, I'd I'm just going to get a motion in it. So okay. Uh, and now, is there discussion? I would like to separate item H1 from H2, H3, and H4. And if, and I'd like to, I think it would be more efficient to deal with items H2, 3, and 4 first, and then H1. We can do that. All right. Um, do I have a motion to approve items H2, 3, and 4? So moved. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, the motion carries. No, um, the move item we accept H. H1. All right, any discussion? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I uh, came for the uh, contracts meeting, but I was too late to hear uh, what was said about H1. That's the modification and extension, faculty professional development, streaming content, and related services. Um, there's a comment in the um, attachment uh, that's provided to the board which reads, tech books provide screen, reader, and translation tools to provide supports to special education students and English learners. I note that this is to increase spending authority from $4 million by a $6 million sum to $10 million. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is, uh, what of the additional 10 million, I mean, of the total 10 million dollars uh, in hoped for uh, spending authority would be allocated for uh, special education students, or is it not delineated as such because the tool is just a tool? So, but if you would, you know, because I wasn't here for it, I um, I wanted to ask. Yeah, let me <clears throat> try this, and if if I'm if there's additional information, um, Dr. White or Dr. Boswell McComas can fill in. Um, we purchase these tech books in different subjects for individual license prices of six, seven, eight, nine dollars a piece, and included in the each book are a number of different features some of which are geared for special education students, some are uh, geared at different levels of comprehension. Um, and so I, from, from the invoices and the bills that I've looked at from existing expenditures, I don't see that the pricing is any way uh, can be allocated according to English learners or special education students. Those are just some of the features um, that we get in this bundle of licenses. So I will just ask if there's any better information. To yep. 
Thank you, Mr. Sarris. Actually, he hit the nail on the head that it, it benefits all students regardless of their um, abilities. So for instance, it does adjust. It, it adjusts for students who need increased font. It, it adjusts for students who need um, Spanish language um, in their text. It adjusts for students who need uh, to highlight the text. So there isn't a percentage per se for special education students, but it does benefit special education students. Thank you very much. Yes, sure. uh, if, I, if I may, um, first of all, I think Ms. Johnson will speak to the curriculum committee um, and its discussion of this, but I just wanted to add that during our contracts committee meeting, we actually had a presentation of the product itself, and we were able to see the, uh, the different features that Mr. Saris and Ms. White have just described. Right. Similarly, during the curriculum committee, we had a, a presentation, and there are, you can, um, click on Spanish or English and it reads to you in Spanish or English. And my question was for English language learners, is that going to then just be an additional crutch? Because they really should be learning in, in English as well. Um, and so they, they said that's up to the teacher. There's also um, different um, reading text with uh, different, I, I guess like a, there's a lower, there was a lower level, a mid level. Um, and there, to my knowledge, there isn't an advanced level yet, but within the, the text right now you can click on a word and it'll take you to a deeper understanding of whatever topic it is. So it was pretty comprehensive um, as far as you know, not just concentrating on any one um, demographic in the, in the school system, not just advanced academ academics and not special needs and not just Spanish. It was pretty Thank you, Arisol. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Causey, did you have anything additional on this uh, item? To yes, I did. Um, so I had submitted my questions last week um, via email, and there was only 30 minutes allotted to the Building and Contracts Committee meeting that we had earlier today uh, to go through um, three contracts and then this one, which is a rather large contract. So I would like to ask the questions that were not answered uh, in that meeting, which is, um, what is the allocation of uh, the student and teacher license cost versus the professional development cost? You talked about uh, licenses, 78,000 licenses um, per year, and it wasn't clear either that the licenses per year, how much they are, and also one of the things that I asked was, um, are they each year or is there a one-time fee? And if it is uh, per year, then how many years are we tied in for under this contract? For instance, uh, with the HP devices, once we sign a lease for a device, then we're committed for four years to paying for that device. So I'm wondering in this contract, which is for six, an additional $6 million, are we tied in for a lease for a certain amount of time, or is it year to year where we can evaluate how it's working for our students? Um, the licenses are uh, are paid annually, and I am not aware if we can add and drop licenses within that one year uh, renewal. Um, I think it's it's dependent on the number of students and topics. So, but I'll have to defer to uh, Mary on that if she knows. Coming to your rescue. Good evening, I'm Dr. McComas. Pleased to be back up here. Um, so the we can drop uh, licenses during the year. Um, I think that was the last question I heard, right? <laughs> Oh, right, and we're not committed. It is a year-by-year -year renewal. Okay, because okay. on their website, they say that typically their licenses are for periods of six years. Mm -hmm. So we have negotiated it to be year-by-year -year rather than signing up to be obligated for six years. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And this is a, a forecast, a comprehensive forecast, assuming that we would move forward each year. Okay. And then the next question I had that uh, submitted that was not answered is, um, Discovery Education's website talks about these tech books and having embedded assessments. Um, so that would mean these assessments are, you know, screen time is required for those. 
Um, also, are these graded and included in student achievement grades, and how often are they being assessed? Right, so let me explain the nature of the assessment. The assessments could range everything from having a student use those primary resources to compose an essay. They we consider an essay and assessment. Uh, they do have built in some functions where you can have multiple choice to have a student self-check. Did they understand the passage that they just, just read? In terms of how teachers would utilize those activities, I know they label them as assessment. Assessment is just a process of taking a temperature of where a child is in their learning process. Um, so where a teacher would choose to use them um, is really up to the teacher's professional discretion. So really those built-in assessments are additional learning activities that the teacher could use as a, a temperature read on are students comprehending the work that I'm asking them to do or not. And the teacher is not obligated to use those. So they would be built in as part of the learning process. They wouldn't be end of unit assessments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So with these um, additional tech books, what was not made clear uh, is the difference between the tech book, the tech book resource, streaming content, digital resource alignment, and professional development. Right. So the digital resources um, are, when we say digital resource alignment, what that means is part of the service um, is to take all of the resources. They have something like a hundred and 90,000 resources and and they help draw that down to the um, standards that we use in our curriculum. So that, that legwork is not done by our teachers, that legwork is actually done by the company. So that's what the alignment of the um, digital resources is. And the tech book, as you saw, what's different from the streaming, and that's what they will do the alignment for us, their individual learning objects as opposed to the tech book, which again is all these um, a curation of learning objects and experiences around standards and bundled in units. That's where it kind of becomes, um, I think, in a traditional mindset. You know, you think of a traditional textbook as being built by units and around themes. That's the, really the significant difference as opposed to these singular objects that are out there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And then um, we received the uh, stat biannual conversions update June 2016, which I was not able to find online. Is that online? It should be. We can, we can check. If, if someone could send in the weekly update where that link is, that would be great. Uh, so in it, it has our stat rollout. And it's uh, talking about year one, year two. We're in year, year three currently with three lighthouse high schools. And it's my understanding that in the budget discussions we had last year from February through May, that the Lighthouse high schools would be the high schools with the devices for two years in order to evaluate it, get the curriculum uh, strong and settled, uh, and so forth. But I see here on year four for year for 27, 2018, uh, that there would be the first year of devices to high schools. So it doesn't say all high schools, it doesn't say additional high schools. So I'm curious, what what amount, if any, high schools are supposed to be slated or, or proposed to be slated? Um, again, getting back to the concern of how much money is this going to cost and in what time frame for us to understand how all of these expenses related around the digital uh, transformation are taking place. Yeah, so you're correct. The uh, Lighthouse High School uh, pilot is for two years, and so that, that would cover that time frame. However, this contract would allow for all students that when we bring those uh, high schools on online, then they will be covered as well. They will not, uh, we will not need to extend the contract by additional licenses. Thank you. And then the other question that wasn't um, completely answered, I know we, we started addressing it, but then we were running out of time, is what is the goal in terms of how much curriculum uh, will be delivered digitally once, uh, and this is page six now, um, in 2018, it's systemic inst institutionalization, uh, including uh, the budgetary alignment. This over here. Yeah, so, so again. What percentage is the goal to be um, 
and, and, and you clarified for me earlier that curriculum is not the resources available to, to the students. So let me restate. What percentage of resources available to the students through textbooks or digital tech books or digital curriculum provided for them. What is the goal for the percentage of curriculum digitally in all of its forms to the students versus print versions? I don't have an exact percentage per se, and that is because it depends on the grade level, the content area, and the alignment to those standards and the new standards that could be, uh, that could emerge over time. So for instance, we know that right now this resource that we're talking about tonight would help us with the integrated approach as we look at the next generation science standards, for instance. And in with those science standards, we know that there is an integrated approach for, um, for all of the the content areas as we're looking at math, science, and some of the literacy components as well. As uh, um, that is the same approach for the college and career ready standards as well. So because of that, we need resources that are also integrated. So as those standards emerge, then there are times where we have to choose resources, some that are digital, and then some that are print. Um, right now, like I said in a uh, contracts committee, we have a hybrid approach based on those standards, based based on the availability of those resources. We have to make sure that industry has caught up to education many times, so we, we need to make sure that there is a, um, we have those available resources. And then we try to follow that rollout um, for devices so that kids can have access uh, to those resources. So there isn't a percentage per se, it depends on the grade level, the content area, and based on student needs as well. Okay, and then with this additional um, tech books, streaming content, and digital resource alignment. Um, is there discussion about what is a safe amount of screen time for our students and giving our teachers advice on that? There's been uh, a lot of concern around that and the Safety and Technology Committee uh, has not come out with any recommendation is my understanding, but I mean, is that something that will be coming given that there is such an increase in what's Yes. Being purchased and as a, a reminder to the board, we are working directly with the school health council, which includes pediatricians, it includes ophthalmologists, um, op um, optometrists, and other um, healthcare professionals who are advising on that work. They are doing the bulk of that work of looking at um, what would be appropriate. Right now, the current research that's out there, as many of you know, has to do with entertainment media, not necessarily a, a educational. Um, use of, of technology. So right now that again the research is very limited on that but I know that the school health council is working on that and will be advising us in that way. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion on H1? Yes, uh, Ms. Brett. Um, super briefly. So when you were going over this program, it seems like an amazing resource. I'm really excited about some of its implications. But I, my only concern is I want to make sure that this is something that's going to really be present in the curriculum because we have 30 or so resources that have kind of come to this page and died as far as like high school education um, just because I've never really used any of these. I know a lot of my peers feel the same way. Is there a way that we're ensuring that this is actually going to be integrated? So yes, it is being um, utilized as a, a reference within our standards, our curriculum guides, as a resource to uh, encourage teachers and students for use. But I will tell you that what speaks greatest to that is actual classroom and teacher use. Mm -hmm. So student usage has increased by something like 439% in a single year. As that resource has become more um, available, to more grade levels. Um, and additionally, uh, teacher use as well has increased, um, I think I had my numbers backwards, forgive me. I think the student increase was in the 500% range and the teacher increase was in the 400% uh, percent range. I could get those exact numbers for you, but I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna flip through the papers. Oh, here we go. Hold on, I gotta hold back here. <laughs> That's, uh, right, okay, so student use 592% increase year over year um, with uh, 2,436,082 resources uh, downloaded or streamed. Uh, teachers increase was 469% uh, with 497, that's where I had that number, uh, 288,000 
uh, resources access. So what we can see is that direct classroom behavior indicates that this is a viable resource and that it is becoming a reliable, a high quality resource for children and for teachers. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm glad that you all considered mm -hmm. that. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, and again, I'll remind you, we did have a complete presentation in the curriculum committee meeting as well as in building and contract. So um, most of the board members did get uh, to drill down into the program and understand what it was about. Um, was it, Mr. Yolfeld, oh, I thought you had your. All right, if, if, if not, um, uh, there's a motion that's on the floor to accept uh, uh, contract H1. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? One opposed. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, uh, Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixon. Our next item is new business, a special project request, bleachers and press box at Chesapeake High School. And I think Mr. Roberts said there he is to present. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Chair McDaniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Tonight I bring forward for approval a privately funded capital improvement project for the purchase and installation of bleachers at Chesapeake High School Stadium with a seating capacity of 710 in the grandstand, including a press box. The project is in line with BCPS's policy and rule 7330. In accordance with this policy, the request has progressed through all normal internal processes for review. The cost is $135,400, of which the Chesapeake High School Booster Club has raised over $35,000 in private donations. The local initiative support corporation has pledged $50,000, and the state of Maryland has set aside $80,000 via House Bill 979. Baffetis and Associates will design, review, seal, and manage the project, while Dante Clayton Corporation will handle the construction. Fundraising for this project totals approximately $165,000, above the $135,400 total for the project. Timeline for completion is scheduled to begin this fall, with completion scheduled in the spring, approximately May 2017. And joining us this evening is Mr. Jess Grimm, principal of Chesapeake High School, and Mr. David Klein, president of the Chesapeake High School Athletic Boosters, are here this evening in support of this request. They are. Also to note, the Chesapeake High School PTSA and greater school community are in full support of this project. So with that, with your approval, we will move forward with the bleacher construction at Chesapeake High School. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Roberts. I, yes. I move that we approve. Uh, my, my friends at Chesapeake always told me I didn't love them as much as I loved Kenwood, but those were the days when I was in the General Assembly. Since I'm on the board, I love them equally. Okay, so right. I'm very proud to move that we uh, adopt this uh, <laughs> adopt this very uh, wonderful community project and a uh, great shout out to the folks in the in the Chesapeake High School community. Thank Mr. You, uh, Chairman, I'd like to second that uh, coming from the <laughs> very same community <laughs> and my friend Bill Bafetis would ask I that I uh, just share that that is his name. He's a past president of the Essex Middle River uh, Chamber of Commerce and has been active in the community for a number of years. Um, this is going to be this is going to be a fun thing at, at Chesapeake and uh, I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Thank you. It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion at this time? Ms. Causey. Um, I just had a question. Um, I definitely support this um, project and I'll be voting for it. Um, coming from a high school where the um, PTA and also the high school boosters did quite a bit in order to get the bleachers there. I understand how, how hard the work is and the commitment of the community is very important, so I'm definitely going to be voting for this. I'm just curious why it's called privately funded capital project um, when in fact $80,000 is coming from taxpayer dollars through, whether it's through the state mm -hmm. um, as opposed to directly from Baltimore County Public Schools. I just, I just don't understand the title, so if someone could explain that a bit. That, in my understanding, I certainly can can defer to to our um, to Mr. Dixon as well. But because the process goes through the private capital the private capital process, it comes under that process in the policy and rule. Though there is funding for through state, but Pete can certainly add to that. Uh, board policy seventy three thirty clearly states that if there are any private funds involved, then we must bring it to board for your approval. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Um, why, I see the date, one of the dates on here is January 20th, 2015. 
do these always take this long? For the, there For was, the if you're referring to the, the, the quote, which document? Uh, the project approval document, it's page one, public county, public high schools. Oh, when the process started, so is the question, mm -hmm. do they, could you repeat Does the question? Does it always take this long? So January 20th, 2015, and this is September of 2016. That process, they may not always take this long, but the reason why this took this long is because there was some, through the license, through the LISC, the License Insurance Support Corporation, there was some language in that contract when they, that grant was funded to Chesapeake High School, and then working with the boosters, some timelines had to be met, so then they had to extend the timelines, and then working with the support of the Maryland State General Assembly for the funding, it took a little bit longer. Okay, well hopefully we can move these along, because the, the Funding was in the 2014 legislative session, so you've been waiting a long time. Can't wait for the groundbreaking. All right. Thank you. Okay, we have, it's been moved and seconded. We've had some discussion. I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Right. Thank you. All right, moving forward. Um, we have a very interesting report, an end-of-year report on second language proficiency. And for that, we'll call Dr. Brown, Ms. Thompson, and Mrs. Rhodes to the table. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Chair McDaniels, uh, Vice Chair Nillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board and the community. Uh, pleased to have um, Lynn Thompson and Nancy Rhodes here from the Center of Applied Linguistics. They have been with us uh, for the past two years uh, providing an evaluation of our second language initiative. They were contracted uh, to do that work for two years and this is actually their third report to us. Um, this will be the summative report for uh, the second year of the initiative. Um, as with other um, initiatives, the STAT initiative, et cetera, um, the follow-up to this from curriculum will be at, at a subsequent curriculum meeting uh, where we'll address um, feedback or, or concerns that come up uh, tied to the presentation today. Uh, we're receiving this report fairly recently and we'll respond accordingly with, with time at the curriculum committee. With that, I'll, I'll turn things over. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, Chairman McDaniels, uh, Superintendent Dr. Dance, and distinguished members of the BCPS Board of Education, we are here today to present the 2016 end of year report on the BCPS uh, Passport Spanish program. My name is Lynn Thompson from the Center for Applied Linguistics and I'm here with my colleague Nancy Rhodes who worked with me on the evaluation of the BCPS Passport program. Let's take a look at the logic model BCPS developed in collaboration with the Center for Applied Linguistics to capture the elements critical to the development of the passport program and to the evaluation of the program. The logic model captures the longitudinal as well as the iterative nature of activities crucial to successful program development. The model starts with planning and logistics, the preparation that is necessary for the program to take place. Preparation activities included scheduling, rollout of technology needed for the program, and planning and writing the curriculum for the program. Cal's task was to look at the measurable outcomes, the next component of the logic model. Cal's evaluation of year one and year two has focused on qualitative measures. We gathered information on program implementation, instruction, and Spanish and classroom teacher perceptions of the program. We also looked at student engagement and satisfaction with face-to-face -face and online instruction. Year one evaluation results were used to inform staff training, curriculum revision and development, and alignment of the program model and program goals in preparation for year two. And in year two, the interim and end of year reports have informed preparations for year three and beyond. Our mixed methods evaluation included surveys, classroom observations, and interviews with principals, teachers, and students. In addition to the results from the Cal evaluations, BCPS will also use language assessment data that they have collected to determine if the pilot program has met its goal, readiness for grade six Spanish. 
And I did want to add a little note about the actual model, the program model. It's what we call a blended model. So it combines online instruction, which is through Middlebury Interactive, uh, along with uh, time with a Spanish language teacher in the classroom. Uh, the uh, Middlebury uh, Interactive program right now is 40 minutes per week and uh, at least 30 minutes per week with a Spanish teacher for year one and year two. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide now. Yep, almost, I'll try. <laughs> Let's see. Open up the door. <laughs> Doesn't want to advance. Let me try again. Usually Mr. Virch opens that door and you ah. angle it that way. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did I go too far, Nancy? Yes. Okay. One back. Here we go. Evaluation Pobrecito. activities. <laughs> okay. We're now going to talk about Cal's evaluation activities. Our team collected data at three points in time, spring of 2015, fall of 2015, and spring of 2016. So we collected data in year one from 10 schools, all in, um, starting in grade four, uh, collected data in year two at five of those original schools. Um, in grades four and five, and five additional schools with grade four. Uh, we collected data from a classroom teacher survey. We conducted site visits, including observations of classes and uh, the MIL, Middlebury Interactive Languages, online sessions. We reviewed the curriculum and materials that were developed for the project. And lastly, we conducted interviews of the Spanish teachers. We conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with students. Uh, we interviewed principals and some assistant principals and Office of World Languages staff. Next slide. To place this end of year report and this presentation in context with the previous phases of the evaluation, I'll provide the passport program strengths and recommendations as outlined in the end of year one. So the following were identified as key strengths, a strong vision, mission, and district-wide support, and that was um, observed from all levels of the district, dedicated Spanish teachers collaborative fourth grade teachers who worked with the Spanish teachers, and useful interactive technology from Middlebury Interactive Languages. So the recommendations were designed to build on the success of the year one pilot program and help increase alignment with best practices. Um, and the recommendations included to increase coordination between the face-to-face -face and online components, focusing on curriculum content and proficiency-based goals. Um, next, to enhance the online student activities to better align with teacher-led instruction. And by the fall of 2015, Spanish teachers already commented that enhancements to the student passport books were helping students complete the online lesson activities in a set sequence and making a stronger link between the face-to-face -face and the online content. Uh, next, um, to plan for the pilot teachers, including the Spanish teachers and the fourth grade teachers, to train new teachers, and that recommendation already took place in the summer of 2015 and continued in this past summer. Um, to fine tune the Spanish program goals for grades four and five so that all the stakeholders will know what the language and cultural goals are. And the goals have now been adjusted to better match the program design. And then lastly, to increase instructional time so that the Spanish, um, with a Spanish teacher to improve student proficiency by the end of grade four and five. So far, um, this recommendation has been implemented for grade five and um, 
Instruction has been increased from 30 to 50 minutes a week this fall with the teacher. So of those recommendations, the first three were implemented by the fall of 2015, and the planning for the last two were implemented by the spring of 2016. Okay, next slide. Okay. Okay, this is a summary of research questions that we looked at in year two. Um, and in red are the related components of the logic model. Uh, first, we sought to identify the successes and challenges in logistics in terms of scheduling and technology. Second, we looked at the extent to which the learning goals and content of the MIL program and face-to-face -face instruction were aligned. Third, we looked at how the implementation of MIL was progressing in new and continuing schools. Fourth, we looked at the nature of face-to-face -face instruction in grades four and five and whether instruction reflected best practices. So I'll now summarize um, eight key report findings um, from 2016 focusing on the strengths. First, students are participating and actively engaged in the face-to-face -face Spanish classes. The vast majority of students, 95% interviewed, reported that they liked learning Spanish and wanted to continue learning it. Second, students are engaged in the Middlebury Interactive Languages online activities. All students interviewed identified something that they liked from the online program, including videos, songs, quizzes, and the connection to the Spanish teacher's lessons. Third, Spanish teachers are highly qualified and dedicated. The teachers demonstra demonstrated best practices in teaching languages to children using the target language 80 to 100 percent of the time to provide comprehensible input for instruction and in integrating culture, subject content, and language into instruction. Fourth, the MIL program is better aligned with Spanish class instruction than the previous year. The staff and Spanish teachers have better aligned classroom instruction with on the online program by redesigning the curriculum and reinforcing online content in the Spanish classroom. Fifth, the revised student passport book activities had a positive impact on instruction and learning in year two. The revisions provided a stronger bridge between face-to-face -face instruction and online and more opportunity for students to apply what they learned in both venues. Okay, next slide. Sixth, the program schools are infusing Spanish throughout their buildings, developing the schools into multicultural communities. When a visitor walks into a passport school, they will be welcomed by a Todos Adelante, Moving Forward Together Team BCPS poster, along with hallways decorated with Spanish work samples, drawings, and photographs. Seventh, active support from classroom teachers is helping students focus on learning Spanish, both in the online and face-to-face -face instruction. And lastly, implementation of the program in new schools and in the fifth grade at returning schools generally went more smoothly in year two than in year one of the program because of adjustments made to instruction and technology from lessons learned the first year. Okay, next slide. <laughs> okay. The same there we go. There. Oh, no, that's back one. Okay. Just to have to have the magic touch for this. Okay, I wanted to highlight five key recommendations. Uh, first, active monitoring of students during MIL and providing clear instructions and directions. Setting expectations for the sessions is needed to make sure students get the most out of their MIL or the Middlebury interactive time. Um, the successful sessions we observed had these elements. Uh, second, whether it be by actively participating in learning Spanish along with students, handing out materials for the Spanish teacher, aiding with keeping students focused or aiding with discipline, an actively engaged classroom teacher made all the difference. Third, we recommend that BCPS explore and address reasons why not all classroom teachers reach an average of 40 minutes per week with MIL. 
feedback from classroom teachers indicated that it was challenging at times to reach an average of 40 minutes a week with MIL due to extenuating circumstances. These included equipment not being in the right place at the right time or difficulty staying within the transition time between classes. Fourth, we recommend that BCPS work with Middlebury Interactive to continue to align Middlebury Interactive Languages online content instruction with best practices for teaching languages to children. BCPS has already been actively working to address this recommendation. Lastly, in an effort to increase student proficiency by the end of grades four and five, increase instructional time with the Spanish teacher in grade four, as it has been done in grade five for year three. This means 50 minutes of instruction with a Spanish teacher and 40 minutes in Middlebury Interactive per week to be consistent with best practices nationally. Okay. In conclusion, um, we'd like to say that Baltimore County Public Schools Passport Program has taken a positive step towards introducing languages language to all students beginning in the fourth grade. BCPS has, achieve, has achieved what it set out to do in the first two years, to take steps to implement a blended learning elementary Spanish program that will be sustainable in all schools. With this foundation and additional student language assessment data, the program can be expected to expand and show marked progress in developing a high quality blended learning model that shows measurable success in increasing student proficiency levels. Furthermore, with the addressing of the report's recommendations, the BCPS Spanish program can ultimately serve as a national model for elementary school language instruction, highlighting the inclusion of all district students and the blending of online and face-to-face -face instruction. Thank you for the opportunity you gave the Center for Applied Linguistics to evaluate your language program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll open it up for questions from board members. If anyone would like to ask a question, Mr. Stewart. So this might be a little far afield, though I'd be interested in, in whether you got into this at all, which is that how does this program, the instruction its implementation as far as blended instruction goes, how does that relate to cultural proficiency? Did you see changes in the way that schools, I mean, you saw obviously changes in the way the schools are approaching language, but also culture, I would imagine. So whether there's indicators to that, you know, we didn't get into here, but I'd be interested in, in whether you can touch on that. Well, it was very obvious uh, when we observed classes um, that culture is a very big component of the curriculum and that the teachers were constantly making those ties and also tying in t uh, to the culture of the Hispanic students who were in the classroom as well. Yeah, and I, I'd say that the, the, um, some of the student, students that we interviewed were saying that they now can talk, um, they can now talk with some of the Hispanic children in their class who didn't speak English and they love communicating with them. So they, they offered very exciting ideas and reasons of why they like learning Spanish specifically for the cultural component. So a practical buy-in, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other, Mr. Yolfelder? How many schools do we have? Uh, I know we had 10 the first year, Dr. Dance, or 15? 40 total. 40 total? 40 total. Um, I, I would suggest to fellow board members, if you had the opportunity, uh, visit one of the schools and visit one of the Spanish classes. It is amazing, and you got to see the enthusiasm of the kids. You can't see it in paper or in a slide here, but it's, it's really dramatic. Um, I, um, Ms. Johnson. Um, thank you. So I agree with um, Mr. Yulfelder. The enthusiasm is great, but um, what is upsetting to hear that we're, some of the students or some of the teachers aren't able to get to the 30 minutes, and it's still not enough time. I mean, when I go around and I talk to students, they can barely say, hola, como esta? So, I mean, they, it's, not, it's definitely not enough time for for anyone to be proficient in anything by sixth grade, because I know that was ultimately the plan, so we can move up um, the different Spanish levels or take the levels away altogether. But if the county is going to move forward with this, we need to make sure that we are actually not just 
sprinkling it in when, where we can because that's not you can't learn anything consist consistently when you're practicing on and off for 30 minutes a week. So um, I'm disappointed to hear that we're not we're not putting more time in this. We have all these. Um, we have a lot of technology, and the students are going to get technology whether it's in school or not. They're not going to get a second language for the most part, whether it's in school or not. So, thank you. Um, I too had a, I had a question. I guess it's more for staff. Um, going back to the recommendation that there be more uh, time with fourth graders with a Spanish teacher, I just wanted to see how feasible that you know, with the challenge we have in getting Spanish teachers, where does that kind of leave us with a recommendation? such as that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And again, we'll be coming to the Curriculum Committee with all of our uh, responses to these recommendations given that they're uh, relatively new to us. But we do know that time is an issue and that we need to uh, try to build in more time. So um, with that, we've adjusted this year with um, increasing time in the fifth grade. And then as we're looking at fourth grade, we do have some s uh, scheduling challenges to make fourth grade a special given that we have exploratory and music and other kinds of things there. So we would have to pull together principals and uh, teachers to see realistically how we could balance the instructional time. Okay, thank you. Any other, uh, Mr. Collins? Yeah, this isn't really a question, but it's really really a follow-up on, on, on what uh, Relita just said and what Marisol said. You know, <clears throat> we were talking about taking positive steps forward. You better enter put the word baby in between positive and steps because at most they're baby steps because uh, kids are not learning Spanish to any significant degree. Uh, whether the schools are decorated or not, there's simply not enough time. And, and, and I'd like to think that this was a serious marquee mark of our system long after all of us on this board are gone and long after Dr. Dance isn't with us as superintendent here anymore. Uh, when these kids are graduating from high school, I'd like to think that we're gonna have bilingual students. Uh, with this program, it's not gonna happen. It's just obvious. So uh, I don't know what we have to do, but if it's important to make, create bilingual uh, citizens in to be uh, college and career ready by the time they graduate in 10 years, uh, then we have to get serious about this program. Uh, this, these, are, these are baby steps. Mm -hmm. I applaud them. I'm not criticizing them. But a whole lot more needs to be done. A whole lot more time and money and energy has to be put into this. I think it's, I think, as Marisol said, this is, this is, this is probably the most important initiative I've seen, far more important, far less expensive than the STAT program but in my opinion, far more important than the STAT program. Um, and we need to do, we need to do better. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think, uh, I don't want the thought to go forward at least that there was a unanimous feeling on this board that this is moving well. I don't think it's moving well at all. But I thank you for your report. And, and uh, this is not a criticism of you all in any way but it's just a criticism of, of the pace with which we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Gillis, you had a... So, yeah, I, I do. I actually, I want to interpret both Ms. Johnson's and the Senator's comments as positive rather than negative, and I'd like to ask the Center for Applied Linguistics, step back from your analysis of this particular program and put it in perspective what you think about uh, the education that's happening in Baltimore County public schools as compared to others you may study? Well, nationally, we see a wide range of types of elementary programs. On the one end are language immersion schools, and I believe Baltimore County has at least one, where instruction is in the immersion language for at least 50% of the day. So students receive math, science, social studies instruction in the language. So that, 
that program on the continuum gets by far the best proficiency, Spanish or whatever language proficiency for the students and their, their content mastery, everything, those get the best results. Um, and some of those programs are up to 100% of the day. Um, total immersion, there's partial immersion where half the day would be spent in the language and their results aren't quite as good. Um, and then below that, there's a wide range of the amount of language proficiency that is attained and it, and it really depends on the amount of language instruction per week. And as recommended by the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, they recommend three to five days per week of instruction, a minimum of 90 minutes a week. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is after, you know, 35 years, 40 years of, of research, monitoring these programs, looking what's going on, looking at best practices. So we do know, as you all are alluding to, and as the staff knows, that the more language instruction you have per day, the higher, higher the proficiency level will be. Thank you. Any other uh, comment? Oh, Mr. Burke, I'm sorry. Um, I hear you, and the three to five days, 90 minutes a week, I would just note parenthetically, not that life is in either war, but even the National Football League thinks kids need 60 minutes a day of fitness. Hey, I'm all for it. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Causey. I would just like to hear from um, Ms. White a little bit more about the program because I, I don't um, feel the same uh, about the results being disappointing. I think that what, that what is my understanding of the program is that this is a ramping up. It's a drawing the students in at a younger age than typical in order to expose them to the language, to the culture, to make it interesting so that as the time allows, I believe in year six, and if you could just specify to that a, uh, a little bit more, that then their proficiency level will increase. Because it's true right now, we have students that graduate from high school proficient in mm -hmm. world languages. They come from advanced placement, five and six in, in Spanish, French, Mandarin, and so on. So it's not that we're not graduating anyone who's bilingual, we certainly are. The, the goal here is to increase that, but it's a ramping up process as I'd like uh, you to explain in a moment. I'd also like to take a moment to uh, reference back to what uh, Miss Abby Byton said at an earlier meeting where she made the comment about the teachers um, are doing more administrative uh, work and it is taking away from their instructional time. So if we're trying to find time for teachers to provide more instruction for the children, um, maybe that's something we really need to consider in terms of um, increasing our teacher to student ratio, but also maybe offloading some of these tasks like walking the children to the cafeteria and so forth uh, to either uh, volunteer programs or other assistants that are in the building. And that of course is a budget issue, but if we want this program to succeed, then that's, you know, budget affects everything. Um, but the other concern, as Steve did point out, is that there are many things that we want our children to spend time on. So I guess my question, along with the ramping up, is when these uh, timelines go up 30 minutes to 50 minutes, where is that time taken from? Thank you for your question. I'll start with the ramping up um, question. And that is, we want uh, students at the elementary level to be able to ask and answer questions and um, on familiar topics using Spanish vocabulary. So at the end of the day, those are our primary goals in terms of conversational language in Spanish. We need them to be able to ask and answer questions on familiar topics using a proper vocabulary. So again, when when um, they progress to sixth grade, then they already have that jump start. Let's keep in mind that traditionally in BCPS, students begin a language in seventh grade and have begun um, a language instruction in the seventh grade. So how, having them begin in the fourth grade gives them an edge up. Certainly it is not enough. Our students and uh, staff members have said to us that they want more time um, to, for students to interact with Spanish. There is an 
an opportunity cost that comes with that, though, in terms of other content areas um, that need to be addressed. The integrated approach we, that we have with, um, of course, our reading instruction, mathematics, social studies, science, and all of the other um, special areas as well. And we want students to have that well-rounded um, approach to their education. So we are balancing that in a way so that students can have um, that opportunity to take advantage of Spanish instruction. With the 50 minutes of time, so again, um, students have time in a blended model use, utilizing um, the Middlebury program. So the recommendation is so that they can rotate through many times through their reading block because we're still talking about literacy. Uh, so that during their small group time, they have an opportunity to rotate through those groups and interact with the program. Again, this program has to follow the STAT initiative because students need access to a device in order to be able to do that. If we didn't have the devices, they wouldn't be able to do um, what they're doing uh, to interact with this program. And in addition to that, they have the benefit of face-to-face -face instruction with a Spanish teacher. And so um, they are able to then address any um, issues that they're having with learning the language on a face-to-face -face, um, and basis and, and um, using that as a special. So that's how we break up the time and how we get uh, that instruction in right now. Thank you. Sure. I, I just want to dovetail what uh, Mr. Ufelder said. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Lyons Mills Elementary School and see their um, Spanish instructor in action, and it was really phenomenal. So I, I think the ramping up is a good model for the children, and I think that the, certainly the teacher I saw was very effective, and maybe um, there needs to be some consideration around Ms. Um, Ms. Byton, the uh, president of TABCO, her suggestions about offloading some of these other tasks from the teachers so that they will have more instructional time for the children. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yolfelder. I have one question, uh, Marita. Uh, what is the language program starting in the sixth grade and through high school? Just yes, so, we, we so can currently right now we have a traditional approach to Spanish 1. For the students who were in fifth grade, m most of those students are enrolled in Spanish 1. Some are enrolled in Spanish 2. But in, in moving forward, we're looking at more of a proficiency model for grade 6 Spanish. So if I had to delineate the two, um, an example that uh, Brian Schiffer, who is our director of fine arts and uh, social sciences, always uh, suggests to me. So that in traditional Spanish 1, for instance, students learn about the language. They learn how to conjugate verbs. And when they're learning about, um, when we're in a proficiency model, they're learning what to do with the language. So if I'm going to learn about a car, I can know about the axle, I can know about the chassis, I can know about the engine. That doesn't, know that, that doesn't mean that I know how to drive. So Spanish 6, a grade 6 Spanish proficiency model, would teach children more about what to do with the language, while also then teaching them all of the critical grammatical um, uh, components to the language as well. Uh, what happens in the other schools where the, we only have 45 schools in this program? What happens to kids who uh, <coughs> go into the sixth grade in the other schools relative to a language choice? And I believe, Brian, all of our students have access um, to the Middlebury program, but they do not have yet the benefit of the face to face instruction. Thank you. All right, Mr. Collins. Just uh, Verlita, following up on, on David's question, um, <clears throat> are, are students going to be required to take uh, Spanish uh, until all through uh, seven, uh, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grade? We have not set, said that they are required, that um, that is our recommendation, that they would follow through the language. Certainly, though, parents and students make those choices based on the languages that are offered at their schools. We certainly don't want to make that choice for a family that may want to switch and have their students um, take French, for, um, for instance. So that is our recommendation, that they follow the language through. But if a family chooses otherwise, we support that decision decision as well. Are, are they going to be required to take a foreign language in grades 6 through 12? On the college and career readiness track, students are required to take two credits of a foreign language in high school. Two? Two credits, yes. That's only two years. For graduation requirements. <clears throat> That's only two years, right? That's the current graduation requirement. Yeah. And what about, what about middle school? 
Not so far, Maryland has not made a middle school requirement. In our, um, in our system, we are promoting um, that students will take a language uh, throughout their middle school experience. But, I mean, I, I just think it's really you know, such a tremendously important thing. I hope we really push hard to uh, encourage that. All right. Any other, Ms. Johnson? Mine is more, more, more of a comment. Um, well, actually, it's a question, the first one. Are, are there any plans in the county, um, and Ms. White, I don't know if you want to answer this or anybody in the, the room, um, any plans in the county to have to bring back some of the more immersion schools, language immersion schools? Well, I think that it really depends on how we progress in terms of our magnet offerings right now. We, um, we're looking at balancing um, the county, as you know, to make sure that what we offer on one side of the, the county we can offer on another. So that would really depend on um, how the system moves with its magnet offerings. Thank you. And this is uh, just a message to um, the principals, assistant principals, teachers out there. So Hispanic Heritage Month started on uh, September 15th and in the last since September 15th I visited probably three or four schools and talked to some other teachers and, and throughout the county we're really not doing a lot for Hispanic Heritage Month um, so if we are moving forward with this language immersion program and Todos Adelante um, one of the things we should be doing in, in account in the throughout the county is making sure that our students no matter where you live if you've got a high population of ESOL students uh, or English language learners or Latinos in your community or not that um, you are recognizing the fact that Hispanic Heritage Month is going on right now so that's just a recommendation to to people throughout the county thank you thank you Thank you. I, I certainly want to um, thank you for the presentation. I think you can tell from the board comments, we really have embraced this uh, goal of moving our students toward becoming bilingual. And we appreciate the recommendations, and we want to certainly follow through. Uh, we're looking forward at the curriculum meeting to, to see how we will respond, because we do want it to be meaningful and tangible to our students as they move forward, because we recognize to be globally competitive today, uh, speaking a second language be, is a tremendous advantage. So again, we thank you for the information and we certainly will look forward to uh, the follow up and, and, and continuing to move forward with this part of our Blueprint 2.0. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. So um, we're uh, at our next agenda item and uh, we're at uh, comments from board members. And um, I think I'll start over with Mr. Verge there and see if he has comments for us this evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, briefly stated, uh, next week is a big week uh, for the Perry Hall community. Uh, on the 6th uh, at uh, Perry Hall High School, uh, Council Person Marks and the Northeast Educational Advisory Council will be uh, having a community meeting uh, about next steps uh, to further discussion about uh, how we get more middle school seats uh, in that area because of this, the, uh, the significant overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School. Uh, the next day uh, is homecoming at Perry Hall High School. Um, and while I live just down by Casamillas, I won't be there because a year ago um, I made arrangements to be out of town. So I won't be there, but I do uh, want folks to know that uh, Perry Hall Middle School is, is a matter that I just discussed with the superintendent on Friday. And it's a matter that's in, in, every, in the forefront of a lot of folks' minds as we look for some way to address this overcrowding. I want to thank uh, Mr. McCray for the steps that he's taken, his responsiveness. When uh, Perry Hall Middle School parents have contacted me about uh, some transportation matters, uh, there's more work to do there, um, uh, as, as parents in, in the area know. Uh, other than that, I, uh, that includes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Ms. Johnson? Um, I'll be brief. I just wanted to express gratitude to a lot of the parents and teachers that uh, have shared their information or their questions about the grading policy that um, I, this is a from my understanding what I've been told these are recommendations this is a work in progress and I'm going to use the word this is a pilot so what I would like is if you have questions please email them to me um, there are there is also a place on the BCPS website where you can enter your information um, any questions concerns comments we would love to hear positive feedback too and um, this 
we need to work on communication throughout the county from administrative level to teachers um, to support staff to the parents because I think it's this is a big change and we're a large county so we ask I ask for patience um, from from the board level but please like I said please email me um, if you have any questions and I will do my very best to answer them for you thank you Mr. Collins uh, it's 824 I can't believe it. <laughs> have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, okay. All right. now, this is an exciting time. Uh, last week was Pikesville's ribbon cutting. We've got a bunch of ribbon cuttings that Mr. Uh, McDaniel's listed at the beginning of our meeting. Um, these are very positive times for uh, for our uh, uh, infrastructure, for our buildings, for our classrooms, for our kids. So this is great. Thank you. And I'll just follow up to Ms. Johnson's comments. There will be a presentation to the board in November from staff on the grading policy. So um, as the community gives us input, we'll, we encourage them to come to that meeting also, and we'll all move together together and to improve uh, the process and the system. So uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, you know, during our public comment, from time to time, uh, we hear uh, speakers uh, state their position, and a lot of times it's from the lack of knowledge, or it's, the, it's or they haven't done their homework, or perhaps it's deceptive. Uh, I want to read, uh, take the, this time to read a memorandum that was issued to the entire board, the superintendent, uh, from Mr. Nussbaum relative to student board <coughs> member voting, September 16th. Dr. Ferrone raised an issue regarding the student board members' vote on calendar, and I want to take this opportunity to respond to his contention. It is clear from the statute that the student board member had the legal authority to vote on issues related to the school calendar. The statute concerning student member of the Board of Education of Baltimore County, which is found in Section 3-2A-05, of the education article provides that student member may vote on all matters except those relating to four specific, including school closings, reopenings, and boundaries. Paragraph 3-2A05C4. In the context of the entire provision, it is clear that school closing relates to the closing of school buildings and not the closing or opening of schools as reflected in the school calendar. For example, Comor 13020901 directs the local boards to establish procedures to be used for making decisions on school closings, that is, closings of buildings as schools. Therefore, it is clear that the term school closing used in the student member voting statute is related to the closing school buildings and not to school calendar issues. In any event, it should be noted that Dr. Rohn seems to be unaware of Comor provision requiring that a motion or resolution may not be declared adopted without the concurrence of the whole board. Comor 13A02010101A. Since the motion on closing for the religious holidays only received five votes, it would have not been properly adopted even had the student member been unable to vote or for that matter, even if Mrs. Eaton's vote did not count. Signif the signif significant question is how many board members voted in favor of the motion and not how many voted against it. Uh, I think it's clear that there are times when we should make sure that the, that the public record uh, is clearly stated. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Causey. Hi, I just wanted to say um, I'm looking forward to the Maryland Association Boards of Education Conference. It's coming up next week, um, spending time with other board members and from our system, but also from around the state, uh, focusing on um, professional development for us and ways that we can work better uh, to serve our constituents, who are our students, our parents, and also our teachers. Um, also, I wanted to say that, uh, as was pointed out a little earlier, that when we talk about the funding for all of these things that are happening in the school system, whether it's the curriculum advancements, whether it's uh, capital construction, that really it is uh, the taxpayers and the voters who we can thank for doing the work that provides the taxes 
things and then voting for those initiatives and so forth that will provide a, a great educational system for our students. So we do want to make sure that they are recognized not only and appreciated, but also that when they give us input that we actually analyze it and understand it. Um, also, I would like to uh, say that the Building and Contracts Committee, um, although the meetings are run uh, very effectively, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, M G Chair, Mr. Gillis, um, but they would be much more efficient and effective if they were held uh, on a day earlier than the day of the meeting, because I submit questions a week in advance, but they're not given to me in writing. Um, and they're not given to me in writing, even at the meeting that's one hour ahead of, of the meeting in which we're supposed to vote. So it's really not an efficient or effective way to do that. And Mr. Virch tonight, in fact, had to ask questions again at the meeting, um, the open meeting, um, that could have been addressed more effectively in the committee meeting if he had been given time to receive the minutes of that meeting ahead of time. So I would just ask the board that we analyze uh, that committee structure. Um, also, I wanted to acknowledge that we did get an email from Dr. Dance about the park testing results, so I look forward to reading uh, the results from that and uh, also uh, scheduling a time where we can discuss it at a meeting. Uh, I would ask uh, Mr. McDaniels to put that on an agenda so that we can have a discussion of that at a board meeting. Um, also, the, there's uh, SAT scores that are out statewide that, um, unfortunately, Maryland uh, 2016 graduating seniors had a decline, which apparently is a gradual decline of many years. So I would ask uh, the chair to uh, have this superintendent staff prepare a report for the Board of Education so that we can understand where our students are, whether our students are making progress, uh, because since the SAT test changed this spring, everything will be all new. So really the analysis needs to be up until the, they took the SAT test in the fall of 2015. So I would ask for a report to understand how our students are doing with the SAT test up to that point. Um, I would also like to uh, point out that the uh, transportation complaints uh, have continued from my area. And um, I would just like to say that the complaints include unsafe bus stops, longer walks to bus stops, longer rides, crowded buses, and a slow response at times from the transportation office, although I have heard that the uh, ladies that answer the phone are always very pleasant. So we really do want to give them a shout out because they are the front line, and I'm sure they um, handle a lot of calls, so we appreciate that. Um, but I do want to say that priority has to be the safety, and it is not arbitrary to return a bus route to last year's route for safety reasons. But what is arbitrary is changing routes that place five, six, and seven-year-olds on busy roads like Shawan Road, York Road, so forth, without a thorough safety analysis done first. So I would really um, appreciate if our transportation office can listen to the concerns of parents, especially parents that understand the exact safety concerns that's happening on their street and their neighborhood, and let's just let the buses turn in, go an extra minute and 30 seconds, and make sure that those children are safe. Uh, so I'd appreciate uh, continued analysis of those bus routes and um, also following back up with the parents on a timely basis. Um, and I do appreciate um, Ms. Johnson's comments about the grading. I have also been receiving um, questions, concerns. Uh, there's letters uh, in the Baltimore Sun about concerns around the grading policy. So I would ask that um, Ms. Johnson and Mr. McDaniels, when that uh, report does come to us at the November meeting that we do include the comments that are coming in through the website and through email so that we can overall understand what the whole community is feeling about the grading and if there are adjustments to be made what those might be. So again I just um, want to uh, thank all the people that reach out and uh, try and make comments and suggestions all for the goal of making this a better school system for each and every student. Thank you very much. Thank you. The best for last. <laughs> yes, Ms. Eaton. It was sad to hear from the representative from CCAC that her son, Dane, was not diagnosed with dyslexia until he was in the 12th grade. I can't fathom how this was possible. I hope that all teachers are educated better to identify students like Dane earlier in their education. However, I am happy that he persevered and was able to graduate from high school. Thank you, Ms. Eaton. Uh, and finally, just uh, some announcements for the evening. Our next board meeting will be uh, on Oct Tuesday, October 11th, 7 p.m. here at Greenwood. Schools are closed on October 3rd and October 12th. 
And also there's a professional development day on Friday, October 21st. These are all the announcements for the evening. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Hey. Okay.